All right. Uh, so this is lecture four of ECE 2305. All right. So in today's lecture, we're going to recap yesterday's lecture. We're going to recap lecture three or some of the key points from it because they actually tie in very closely with what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we'll then talk about analog and digital data transmission, understanding the differences, what they are, and uh, you know why is this important? Why should we differentiate between, let's say, having our data that's transmitted in an analog format versus a digital one? Uh, we'll talk about transmission impairments because the real world is not like the ideal world. And then finally, we'll talk about capacity, in which case we'll also tie into a little movie that I will ask all of you to watch at the end. Okay? So, let's recall from last class. What did we learn? So first of all, we saw the all-important sine wave. We saw how important the sine wave was for several reasons. We saw how it can be used in order to represent any sort of signal waveform in terms of the weighted, com um, weighted combination of multiple sine waves with different amplitudes, different phases, and harmonically related frequencies. We also saw how sine waves can be used as a carrier for supporting data transmission. We're going to see this again a little bit later in today's lecture. And then finally, and I was kind of rushed in the last lecture, so I really want to dig in this a little bit more, okay? And I actually posted some stuff on my WPI um, to talk about electromagnetic spectrum because we all love electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, we're also going to talk about how it's allocated, all right? So first of all, I think, I, again, I touched upon this. I touched upon electromagnetic spectrum. But I want to do this justice, because it's actually really important. Uh, even someone at the end of the last class asked, um, you know, isn't there an issue with scarcity of electromagnetic spectrum? And you're absolutely right. There is definitely an issue in terms of the amount of available spectrum out there for, su for supporting um, the growing number of wireless applications and the growing number of wireless users out there who want access to wireless, right? So in fact, folks like myself, you know, when I came to the US in 2005, <laughs> what was the first thing that I worked on? I worked on how to get better access to wireless spectrum. What was the low hanging fruit? Where, what were people were looking at? It was TV spectrum. So it was kind of amazing. Um, yesterday, I think there was about three, four, five folks around me and said, how many of you watch TV over the air? And they all raised their hands. I'm like, Wow, okay, so I'm not the only one, you know, using one's noodle and saying, who wants to pay the 100 or $150 for cable when you can get, you know, the TV for free, right? So, okay, I'm going to raise up hands. How many people here watch TV over the air? Maybe it was just those five people. <laughs> no, no, but that's cool. That's cool. So what happens is, if you notice, out of a population of 86, maybe six or seven people raise their hands. And that's sort of the argument that a lot of industries are saying. Well, how many people are using TV spectrum? Maybe I can deploy cellular networks into that spectrum and use those channels. Maybe I can have other applications use that spectrum as well. Like one community in particular is the public safety community. You know, when there's a disaster, when there's a hurricane, when there's like no centralized wireless service like cell phones or Wi-Fi and stuff, and public safety folks say, there's a burning house. How did it communicate? And what ends up happening is that these, wa these uh, public safety folks need their own spectrum. So they're looking at TV spectrum too. But spectrum is more, or, uh, is more than just TV. Like here's a laundry list of some more commonly known um, and not so commonly known. Like uh, there's one in particular I kind of like. Uh, so you have AM radio. Again, how many people listen to AM radio? Ooh. Oh, okay. Yay! Yay! Okay, a few people listen to AM. FM? A little bit more. Yay! Um, television, we already saw that. Uh, wireless microphones? Yay! You know, wireless microphones have their own dedicated frequency. And it turns out it's actually in the same frequency as television. Ooh, okay. Conflict. This one, people don't know as much about as they should. But yet, you probably have experienced it when you were flying. How many people here fly or have been on a plane? Hey, then you absolutely know what AB, ADSB is. This is the little transponder on the plane that says, 
boop, here's my position, this is my altitude, this is the direction, this is the wind speed, this is how fast I'm going. So if you watch, like, let's say, all 20 episodes of Air Disasters on Netflix, like my wife and I did, and you see all the horrible ways that you can die in an aircraft disaster, what you will realize from that show is that the, you know, that little, you know, radar thing on the top of uh, air traffic control, they seldom use that. They actually have this. Like, what happens is there's something called NextGen, which is a U.S. Uh, FAA. I think it's FAA. But it's um, a program where they want every plane to have this installed on it in order to provide their exact position, altitude, direction, wind speed, all that information and communicate it to, let's say, one or more ground stations down below. And it's actually no secret. Any one of you can actually pick this up, too. Right? So um, let me see. What frequency? Yeah. So I believe the extended version is at 1090 megahertz. You can pick it up, and it's pretty cool. So I've asked Lou to explore which RTL SDR we should be using for this course. So that information I'll give out soon. But one of the things you can have, there's a demo and the RTL SDR. So this is a tiny little wireless device. You plug it into your laptop. It comes with some open, open source software. It does receive only, but one of the demos it does is it tries to find all planes within about 150 miles. You'll see all air traffic around Worcester, or wherever you are. So this information is not encrypted. It's not secret. All planes are emitting this, right? And so what happens is that, that thing is actually, people don't know the acronym, but this is how they keep track of you. They don't use like ra military radars and they uh, you know, send pings and they say, oh, that's where you are. Those actually, according to air disasters, say it's kind of inaccurate. So, so yeah, a ADSB. ISM, we all use ISM. If you use Wi-Fi, you're using ISM. You are using 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz. Some folks might be using a five, but probably not likely. And UNII, Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure, that's the lower 5 gig spectrum that people use for Wi-Fi as well. All right? And there are a lot more frequencies. In fact, how many frequencies are there? There are lots of frequencies. And I say that, but I, I, mean, I mean that in a non-sarcastic way. What, let's, so I dump this under potpourri. Because, you know, it's kind of like, hmm, this is kind of interesting. What happens is I dumped a bunch of spectrum allocation maps. This is for the United States, okay? And, and what happens is we're starting at, you know, the hertz, maybe kilohertz range, all the way, and I believe that's 300 gigahertz. So light is usually in the terahertz range, but that is still not non-negligible. That's still pretty high up there. So if you zoom in, do, do, do. Broadcast. So this big blotch here is AM radio. Down below, here's your TV broadcasters. And then let's say we move a little bit to the side. Oh, let's get rid of that guy. Bye bye. So more TV channels. Sorry, no. That, yeah, FM is here. So there are a few TV channels flanking the FM radio, 88 to 108. So again, I gave the justification where those numbers from those. FM broadcasting stations are, right? Like, like 103.9 FM, you know? It's because it's located at 103.9 megahertz, right over here. Then you have a bunch of other things. You have aeronautical, radio navigation, TV broadcasting. Sometimes the, these channels are double and triple booked between a variety of different applications. Like mobile satellite seems to be uh, double booked, or and no, sorry, triple booked with whatever mobile and fixed are. But what happens is you might say, well, what do these things mean? So it turns out, and I think there was kind of a cool, actually, I'm going to close that. There's kind of a cool little blurb I just came up with on the fly. Um, little dramatic, but nevertheless, I kind of like the beginning sentence, which is basically electromagnetic spectrum is a finite natural resource just like Water, oil, timber, gold, etc. Well, except that, you know, and you might say, well, you can't get rich on spectrum like you do with gold. Absolutely incorrect. Why are, imagine if you are selling your service provider, like you have now, you have Verizon, you have AT&T, you have Sprint, uh, you have T-Mobile, all duking it out. 
to get Spectrum. Like, you know, and they're paying big bucks for it because how much is your cellular service plan? 100 bucks between two or three people or something like that? Um, now, imagine if there's like a million of you subscribing to that. That's a lot of money. Oh, and then there's overages and other types of data plans. Oh, I'm tethering. Oh, that's $50 more per month. You know, so it adds up, adds up, adds up. Now what happens is, in addition to these guys, you have Google, you've got Microsoft, and you have other players, even Walmart. Walmart wants to be your service provider, right? And they were even looking. You might say, well, who, who, where, where could Walmart play in this business? There was actually a little bit of spectrum for sale, and it got bought by a company called Light Squared. And Light Squared said, oh yeah, we could deliver. What we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll provide access and then let's say the provider will actually be like a Walmart or some sort of retailer, but then it kind of fell through. Yes? I thought all the, uh, like the Walmart, Google, and other carriers, like these smaller carriers were MVNOs of the bigger carriers. Yes. What, but what, what they want to do, that's a great question. So right now you've got this model where you have the Walmarts and stuff sort of like being secondary providers through, let's say, the big guys, right? But what happens is they want to cut out the middle man, right? So you even have like, uh, like, you know, the Google project where like you have essentially Wi-Fi beamed down to the ground, which you're trying in like Africa and the like, right? But what's interesting is uh, suppose you don't, let's say you want to just get into cellular frequencies, not Wi-Fi frequencies. Um, and so you had this company, but there was a big failure with that because it turned out they were too close to GPS. And the problem is you have a very loud signal next to a very delicate signal. No one's allowed to transmit anywhere near GPS signals, right? So GPS, I forgot where it was. I think it was like 12 or uh, 1300 megahertz. And what happens is it was, they were ruled, they, they said you cannot develop that service right next to GPS. They, they went bankrupt and, and the like. So people are trying to find ways of delivering data to all of you, to me, to everyone, right? Because it's a big, big money maker. And you might wonder, is it the only United States? Absolutely not. The U UK? Oh my God, this kind of looks similar. <gasps> I think there's a conspiracy. There, there is a conspiracy, but, uh, uh, but not, not a malicious one, trust me. Let's see Canada. Let's see my native land. <coughs> do, do, do. Oh, they found me. Let's see. Come on, Canada. Don't disappoint me. Yay! And in both English and en français. So what happens is we have it in both official languages. We have the spectrum allocation. And the reason why they all look kind of similar is because imagine you got a TV set in the United States and you move to Canada. Let's say you say, oh, I think Canada is great. I don't mind the you know, freezing temperatures and the polar bears walking around the street. True story, there's polar bears there. And what happens is your TV no longer works. The reason that all these map, uh, spectrum maps look very similar is if you have wireless equipment in one country and then you go to another country, do you want to get rid of your TV and buy a new TV? No. And so what happens is there's a UN organization called the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and they kind of are like the forum to sort of have all these federal governments kind of work together and say, like they don't have to be exact, but approximate so that you don't have issues of interoperability, <coughs> okay? So th you can check this out later on, um, you know, tonight if, if you have nothing better to do, or put it on your phone and show to your friends whatever party that you're going to, okay? <laughs> so, trust me, it's, it's a blast. So, so electromagnetic spectrum, you can see that people are double booking, triple booking, and also, like they're trying to make the most use out of their spectrum. So you'll see that in some of the spectrum maps, like for instance, like FM and AM radio, even radar, you know, what happens is like it's always more ideal to play at the lower frequencies and in the higher frequencies because of propagation characteristics uh, for the most part. And uh, what happens is it's usually a first come first serve. So AM and FM technology was around first. And what happens is like you might say, well, I get AM and FM for free, but there was a big investment by the radio station, by the infrastructure to set it up. So people, usually governments don't want to say, hey, you need to move out and go to another frequency. That's usually a no-no, right? And then radar, of course, for national defense and, and the like, and that's in a few frequency bands. And then people just progressively go up higher and higher spectrum because that's what's available left, right? 
So that's why, like, you know, when I made this laundry list here, there are way more transmissions out there than meets the eye. There's even one thing. I'm not sure how many people here have a car. Car? Car people? Car people, hey! And I know, like, my uh, future MQP team, they're here, so um, they probably hear of me saying this. So how much wireless is in your car? So your radio, right? Your Bluetooth, your FM. Um, maybe you have OnStar. Is there any other wireless? Yes? GPS. GPS, okay. Anything else? Yes? Yep, that would be a wireless device. Anything else? Yes? Radio, yes? They do. Is it a useful signal? I, 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 would, I, would, I would give you credit for that. Anything else? I think I saw an arm go up here. No? So, Bluetooth? Bluetooth. So, okay. Um, how many people here drive a car that's built in 2008 or later? Okay. How many of you had the little tire pressure sensor? One. Anyone? Tire pressure sensor thing go off? So, good, good. So what happens is your tire pressures are uh, sensors are wireless. So it depends on what type of car you have and which auto manufacturers, but most of them, in the stem of your uh, tire, they actually have a little device, and it transmits wirelessly to one of the 100 so computers on your car. It says, oh, here I am. The tire pressure is normal and does it every few minutes. So if you change your tires like I do every winter to snow tires, you get that annoying little warning light that says low tire or no tire pressure. And so what ends up happening is that's operating at 315 megahertz. So it's, and you know, there are, so there's all these little custom little wireless applications that are always alerting you to things like tire pressure monitor readings and stuff. So, how, so now the bottom line is we have all this information. How is it sent? So FM and AM, we would say, is an analog form of data, right? So AM radio or FM radio, it's all sound. We're not digitizing it. It's like, let's say you have a broadcaster, and he's speaking on the radio, and it's broadcast throughout a region. And it's, so it's an analog source of data. And when I mean data, let me change that. Data usually implies like binary or digital information. It's an analog source of information. OK, so let me be clear. So that's a misnomer if I said it anywhere. Digital, on your hand, is what your computers spew out, what your cell phones produce, with the speech coder, right? You talk into the cell phone, and then the first thing your cell phone does with that speech is it digitizes it into ones and zeros. And then it sends it through a digital means of uh, transmission. So what happens is you have two different types of sources of information, and you also have different ways of communicating it over the air. And so let me, let me give an example what that, how, how that's achievable, OK? So we can do both analog. An, uh, amplitude modulation using analog signals and amplitude modulation using digital signals. We did a little bit about this yesterday as well, but I really want to iterate. Okay, so let's see. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. So, so okay. So let's say we have uh, amplitude. So modulation, that term, what we're doing is we're trying to represent information using some sort of signal, right? So let's say we call this analog. And then let's say we have amplitude modulation. And that's digital. OK? So let's say speech, OK? So let's say the original signal. looks something like this. Like this is my speech that's going like that. Okay? So let's say this is my speech signal. Okay? And then what happens is what we notice is that speech, and I didn't bring this up. This will be in a few slides from now. Speech is usually um, occurs between, has a frequency of between 0, 0-ish, zero and about 8 thousand hertz or eight kilohertz so it's relatively low frequency if and what we know is one thing so if we try and communicate speech maybe I can do this room maybe I can do this in this building if I scream loud enough I would suspect that the departmental office would hear it right but is it effective in a one mile radius 
right? If I want to communicate to mom and or and let's say she is like, or actually no, let's say not my mom. Let's say if my wife was on campus today and she was at Boynton Hall and I said, hey Jan, can you hear me? Well, she just might barely hear me. What's a better way? A better way is how about I want to propagate this using something called a carrier. So what I want to do is I want to take this original signal, but I want to send it to a frequency that might have more favorable characteristics that can penetrate walls and buildings, and at the same time, bring it out of audible range. Because imagine if I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, there will be about two dozen faculty, maybe WPI police also after me, for, like, you know, for noise or something like that. So what I want to do is I modulate. And what do I do? So what I do is I choose a sinusoid. Ah, oh, we go back to our friend the sine wave. Yay. And what I do is, let's say it's a high frequency sine wave. Okay. So let's say it's nice, it's even, but it's very high frequency. Very high frequency. So what I do is I actually multiply the two together. So when I combine these two guys, they produce something that looks like this. So this is over time, just to be clear. Time, time. What I get is the following. So let me see. This is a little tricky to draw. Okay? And so you might say, okay, what is that mess? <laughs> and you would be right. What, what this is, is I basically superimpose this high frequency sinusoid in underneath this guy, such that the envelope Actually, it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> the envelope you can see on top and bottom, so that's kind of the mirror image around the x-axis, that's my signal. And that is what we call an envelope. It sort of covers the high frequency carrier signal underneath. And you might say, OK, so why do I do that? What propagates in the air? It's not the envelope. It's that high frequency thing, right? So what happens is I'm sending, let's say, to my wife in Boynton Hall, I'm sending something that's at hundreds of megahertz. It's propagating through. No one's hearing it, not even dogs. It's way higher frequency than that. If I put enough energy into it and she has a radio, she can pick that signal up. And then what happens is her radio her receiver will say, what is the envelope here? So that's the role of your transmitter and your receiver. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. What happens is the receiver will pick it up and say, OK, I see this thing. And what it will do is say, what, what's, what's the overlaying sort of long-term signal that's kind of wrapping around that sinusoid? What, what the receiver is going to look for is this, the dotted line. So it's going to pick up. It's going to pick up the squiggly, the, the fast speed thing, and what's going to do is it say, okay, where's the pattern? So your receiver will pick up the pattern and it will extract it, and you're going to get the original signal back. All right? Very complicated, but this is what folks used before the digital age, right? So what folks did is they basically take your original signal, you fit in this high frequency sinusoid into it. So the amplitude changes over time that matches your low frequency speech signal or audio signal and send that over the air or on the wire, picks it up at the receiver, and then the receiver extracts that low frequency envelope from that high speed signal and throws away the high speed thing. Digital? It's a little bit different. I, again, I talked about it yesterday. Digital. The original signal looked like this. Okay? 
And you might say, okay, what do I do with this guy? This is what you do with this guy. Let's say, yeah, that's cool. What, let's say that we take four bits at a time. One, two, three, four. Let's forget about that guy for now. <laughs> and then what happens is I say he's a one. He's a two. He's a three. And this guy here is lucky a four. What happens is we have something called a code book. We have something where if we have four bits, every unique bit pattern has an amplitude assigned to it. Right? So how many possible patterns, how many different amplitudes, how many different amplitudes can we have? Two to the four, right? So four bits. So if you, if you do, you know, the, the pre-calculus, the, uh, um, not combinatorics, but whatever, like, you know, so what's two to the four? <sighs> thank you, thank you. My math is not working on a Friday, okay? <laughs> thank you. So there's 16 possible amplitudes that I can represent. I have four of them right here. So what do I do? What I do is I say, okay, I'm going to have A1, A2, A3, A4. And so now during this, let's say these four bits are represented across a time period, another time period, another time period, and then finally the last time period. Okay? So every T, 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 T. Let's say, here's the first sign. Okay? And that has amplitude A1. Then, let's say A2 looks like this, has that amplitude. Let's say A3 looks like that. And then A4 has something that looks like this. All of them distinct amplitudes. Okay? Yes. Just need to make sure I have enough periods. Okay. And then your receiver at the other end, what it's going to do, so this also has a carrier frequency, that high speed sinusoid. But every T seconds, your receiver is going to say, what is the amplitude now? What is the amplitude now? What is the amplitude now? And so on and so forth and so on and so forth. And what it does is every T seconds, it says, I received this amplitude and it knows, like these guys, they all belong to a code book. And the code book is shared between the transmitter and the receiver. So what ends up happening is both ends know the code book. And so what happens is when the receiver receives an amplitude across T seconds, it says, aha, this is what you sent me. You sent me A1. And then it says, but A1 is 1011. That's it. And then it outputs 1011. Oh, A2 is set next. And it should be equal to 0101. It outputs 0101. So what happens is the difference between the an, 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 the, having an analog source of information and then using amplitude modulation is a little bit different than amplitude modulation using digital data. So amplitude modulation on analog data, you're communicating the analog signal, but superimposed on, in this case, a carrier, and the amplitude contains the analog information. In the case of digital, the amplitude dictates what bit pattern is being communicated every T second. All right? Yes. Oh, 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 it does not mean prescription, it means receiver. So that's our shorthand. In this class, when you see TX, Transmitter, RX, receiver, and then uh, TXCR, transceiver. Transceiver has both receiver and transmitter. Yes? Um, for a radio intended uh, signal, signal uh, yep. you have to handle finding the amplitude. We'll get to that. Yeah, so, so how does, um, when, when you have more distance between transmitter, receiver, and the thing you're describing is called path loss. So we'll get to that in a second. So that's a, that's a great question. All right. Discard. 
So, oh, I'm just messing. So, and, and then we also talked a little bit about how the transmitter receiver handles that information. I kind of contained in both slides. So, what we're going to do b before we go into the impairments, of course, path loss is one of them. Let's talk a little bit about audio signals. So, in WPI, we don't have a speech processing course. So, we have to make do. So, for audio, so speech communications is usually supported between... Um, we don't have it here. Oh, yeah, we do. 100 kilohertz? No, nah, it's a little bit more. No, it's 100 hertz to 7 kilohertz. But in general, your music and stuff goes as high up as 20 kilohertz. And so why is this important? So all human beings, I would say it's even higher than 7 kilohertz. Your, your book says 7, but it's really more like 8. And so what happens is all of us, you know, all this range, all the m noise that's coming out of my mouth, right? Like all those frequencies, all it's really my speech is all a collection of sine, sine waves combined together to make very specific noises. And what's kind of interesting is each sound that comes out actually has a different composition of these sine waves with different intensities. And so what speech processing folks and audiologists do is they actually chart it out, every different type of noise, and then there's a, sp a specific sort of characteristic with each one of them. We call them phonemes, okay? So what happens is, uh, is actually a phoneme, and it, it's a letter A. And what happens is it's called a vowel phoneme. So what we look for in particular are sort of the strongest frequency, the strongest sine waves in that signal. We call them formants. So, or harmonics. So there's usually the first, second, and third formant. So, ah, uh, has a very characteristic first, second, third formant in frequency. And then let's say, oh, uh, is also a vowel and has a different set of formants or very strong sine waves at the first, second, and third uh, sort of frequency and so on and so forth. But then there are other phonemes like, that's actually, a for, that's actually a phoneme. And we call those fricatives, right? Because what happens is that noise actually has very high frequency com, uh, content. We also have something called nasals, like M and N. And so how do I know all of this? And you probably have all heard of this before. So how many of you use a telephone? OK. And so you might wonder, when you're talking, let's say, Oh, can you please spell out uh, Massachusetts? Okay, M-A-S-S. -S. It's like, oh, is that N? No, it's M. W what's, what's happening there? What's going on? What happens is the old school telephones, the legacy systems, they cut off all frequencies at about 4 kilohertz. So what happens is those phonemes that have energy in the higher, like closer to 8 kilohertz, gets cut out. So M and N and F actually don't sound the same on the phone. That's why it's so irritating. You talk to somebody, and it's like, first of all, when you talk on an old school phone, everybody talks like this. And that's because your high frequency components are totally removed. And you might say, why in God's name are all those higher frequencies cut out? And the reason is capacity. Again, we're going to be talking about this at the end of class. The old school telephone networks, what they're trying to do is accommodate as many people on the phone network at any given time. And they figure, they say, do you really need to talk to somebody with all 8 kilohertz of frequency? No. So they cut it in half. They give you 4 kilohertz so they can accommodate two people in that one channel rather than just one. 4 kilohertz versus 3400 hertz? I would say 4. Like, I, the book says 34, but... In general, like if you don't remember exactly, you just say four. But, but essentially, it's half. Okay? And so that's why if you talk on the phone, you have something that like sounds very much like this. But when you talk on Skype or you talk on a European cell phone, the Europeans, they have a speech codec, uh, AMR Wideband Plus. It sounds different, right? When you talk Skype to Skype, it sounds like the person's right next to you. But when you talk on a phone, everybody talks like this. Because Skype 
And voice over IP doesn't have this limitation because bandwidth is all there. You, you, you can use all 8 kilohertz of the speech bandwidth, right? So that's kind of the reason why, like with telephones, you have kind of like that sort of um, halved spectrum. Like you don't have that presence, that depth, because those high frequency parts of your speech are missing, right? So we won't go into this too much, but um, I actually, I don't think there's any speech courses here at WPI. So I don't know what, like if you want to talk more about phonemes and stuff. In fact, um, so I teach ECE 503. In fact, this, this semester I'm teaching it. And as examples in uh, digital signal processing, I just give the students MATLAB problems in, um, in speech communication. So if you know MATLAB and you want to play with speech communications, just let me know. I can give you a few examples. It's a lot of fun. So especially if you want to put like sinusoidal tones in your speech, it's really annoying. Like imagine me talking and there's at the same time, you know, you won't pay attention. Okay. Let's, let's wrap things up with transmission theory. So there are good things and bad things with analog. So first of all, analog is great because you have a carrier and you just superimpose whatever sort of analog information on top of that carrier. Um, and uh, you know, it could also be digital. You could put, like uh, th there are a few types of coding schemes where you could superimpose on top of like an uh, analog signal and stuff. But the problem with analog is that over distance, um, that signal gets attenuated, and you're going to need to amplify it. But when you amplify it, you also amplify this thing called noise. And you might say, what's noise? So in the real world, like let's say here, you know, and I want to talk, and then everyone's like, like blah, 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 and then like 86 of you, that's a lot of like background chatter. That's noise. That's <coughs> unwanted signals. <laughs> no, just kidding, kidding, kidding. So what happens is, um, the problem with analog communications, because the entire sig the signal is, is an analog waveform, the only way to correct for the weakened signal is what you do. You take an audio, like you take an amplifier, whether it's a wireless signal, wired signal, audio signal, and you repeat. You basically take it and put a big gain. So let's say you take 2010, and you take some sort of power amplifier, and you just increase the amplitude again, and you send it on its way. That's great but your amplifier does not segregate, does not separate between the useful signal and the background noise that's in it. So when you send the signal, you also amplify that noise behind it. And that's super bad. Digital, on the other hand, is a little bit different. So the problem with digital, well, the good things with digital is that you have repeaters. You basically, if, you, if, you're no, if your signal gets kind of weak and stuff, it gets decoded at this thing called repeater, it's processed, the errors are taken out, it's re-encoded, it's rebroadcast, and the noise is not amplified. But the problem with it is that, okay, so you have repeaters, there's complexity, um, you, you can, and you, your noise is not amplified, but in what happens is the integrity of your bits is a problem. So for instance, analog versus digital TV. This happened a few days ago. My wife and I wanted to watch Mindy Project, and what happens is we turned on, I think it was Fox, and what happened was, ever so often, because we're watching digital TV, there's no more analog TV in the United States since <coughs> 2010? Let me double check that, but I think it's 2010, and what happens is ever so often, <coughs> blue screen, can't find signal, comes back, <coughs> and what happens is digital TV, it uses MPEG coding in order to compress the video data. And what happens is, if the signal's too weak, it's all or nothing. With analog TV, you just have a lot of snow. It's not as great quality of video, but you can still kind of see through all that garbage, right? So you can, with analog, you'll get it, you'll get the amplified noise, but you'll get it. With digital, what happens is you get the MPEG errors, the green blotches and the blue screens and everything. So what ends up happening, those are the trade-offs you have with the technology. But when digital has slightly decent signal quality, it is, it's nice. It's like HD, and it's always going to be HD. Whereas with analog, there's kind of like that variability, if you will. But what happened is, I'm not sure where you guys were when um, the digital, uh, the analog TV channels were turned off in the United States. At 11.30 at night, my PhD student and I 
we were parked next to Bunker Hill the, the, uh, in Boston, the uh, monument. We had my spectrum analyzer on, and we're both watching the analog TV channels shut off. Oh, it was so beautiful. So you see this, this little spike, and that's like who knows what analog TV channel, and then it disappears. And then another one disappears. And then you had one of these digital TV channels move to a new frequency and stuff. It was like ballet. It was awesome. Until the uh, National Parks officer pulled up and shone a spotlight on us. And wh what do you say when you have two non-US citizen guys in a car with a weird light and some scientific equipment next to a national <laughs> monument? And then he says, uh, so what you're doing? And I said, well, I'm Professor Wiglinski. I'm from WPI, and we're watching the TV channel shut off with my scientific equipment and my PhD student here. And he's like, OK, we, we had a report of a car break-in. OK, carry on. You know, and it just kept on going. So yeah, it was awesome. All right. OK, real world situation. So let's, let's make it real. So what happens is, so there was a point about path loss. There are a lot of impairments. This is what keeps me employed. There are a lot of bad stuff happening out there to our transmissions. Things like signal attenuation, absolutely. And it could be very, very good or it could be very, very bad. There's delay, there's noise, there's aliasing, okay? So, signal attenuation. So what this means is your signal, like just like my speech, so if I'm screaming, oh! You know, my mom, 350 miles away in Montreal. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Like, she cannot hear me because my speech attenuates. Wireless signals do the exact same thing. Otherwise, cell phones don't work anymore. And Wi-Fi doesn't work anymore. Because have you noticed that a Wi-Fi network here will not reach someone with a laptop 500 feet away? Because wireless signals decay as a function of distance. Actually, it's a square law. And so we have that type of attenuation. But wait, there's more. What happens is, just like in physics, I'm not sure how many of you took a physics class. I'm assuming all of you have taken a physics class. The ripple tank. I'm not sure how many of you have played with a ripple tank. I came from a really cheap high school. And what happens is we're trying to understand the com combination of waves, both destructively and co uh, destructive, uh, com constructively and destructively. So we have these little beads and they're making ripples in the tank, and you see super peaks, and you see super valleys, and you see waves canceling out, and these beautiful patterns. Wireless signals, any sort of electromagnetic energy does the exact same thing. And so what happens is, that's really why, like, you know, for instance, oh, I think I got bad cell phone coverage here. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, okay, perfect. You know, the reason is the physics of the environment, the radiation is bouncing off everything. And so what happens is you might be in what they call a null, where you basically have some of the signals get out of phase with each other and destructively combine where you are. And if you just move a little bit, you might get great coverage over here because the two signals constructively combine and give you good reception, right? So there's that attenuation, which is very location specific, very frequency specific. And so there's a few techniques you can do, repeaters, amplifiers. You can use something called an equalizer, just like with audio, right? Audio equalizer. A few years ago at CES, the biggest sort of like the, the demo that won, like, you know, I'm not sure if there was a uh, People's Choice Award, that won the People's Choice Award or got the most attention there was essentially the Sony stereo system. And what caught everyone's attention was at the beginning, before you start it up, this little thing goes up and it goes, and then went down. What was it doing? It was sounding out the room. It was trying to figure out what is the acoustics of the room, and then it automatically tuned its equalizer. So when you then played the speakers and stuff, it knew the harmonics, where it should concentrate, like where, how it should tune the speakers such that uh, the sound does not cancel destructively where you are, right? Just like audiologists, whenever you have someone who studies sound come into a room, what they're going to do, the first thing, you can tell an audiologist like a mile away. <laughs> they're going to do that and they're going to listen for a minute. They're trying to hear the echo, if you will, in that room. All right? So equalizers, kind of like once you figure out what the room is like, you then tweak, um, let's say, whatever algorithm you use for receiving that signal. Say, well, if the room is distorting the signal, I'm going to undo it because I know the physics of the room. 
Delay? Well, delay is always bad. Like, you know, how many of you use Skype? Skype people? Skype people, hey! How annoying is it when it's like, hey, can you hear me over there in New Zealand? Hey, are you, oh, I'm over here. And like, you know, it's just like, ah. So delay is bad. Delay confuses uh, communications. And if you have a radio that's not that smart, it's a problem. Noise, noise comes from everything. Comes even from me sometimes. But noise is an unwanted signal. It comes from the thermal excitation of the metal that's in your radio. It comes from the intermodulation products of the non-idealities non of your radio, the crosstalk, the interference from other communications, even impulse noise. It's just like spur of the moment. There's like a shock to the system and create even like, who said, um, who said spark plugs? Spark plugs. Spark plugs. So that's why in vehicular applications, everything is shielded to the hilt because spark plugs make so much noise, especially in the power supply. You need to keep it isolated because spark plugs make a ton of noise. It's very wide band. Yes, that's a great point. Ah! <sighs> so aliasing is something we won't look at too much, but in 2311, 2312, actually no, sorry, not 2311, only 2312, you're going to experience a lot of. So aliasing is essentially when you don't sample fast enough and then everything gets smeared together and it becomes a little bit difficult to reconstruct the original signal if you don't sample at the right rate. But we won't talk too much about that because that's math, right? So. <sighs> All right, so la last but not least is capacity. So capacity has many different names in the communications world. So capacity, <coughs> capacity means either how many users can be supported by the network. So if any of you have been to an airport and then suddenly your flight's delayed by an hour, and then you tried using your cell phone and you can't get through, that's because your cell phone site capacity has just been maxed out. What happens is a cell phone base station in the cell supports maybe a few hundred people, but let's say there's like two or three flights, each a few hundred people, and they're all delayed. What's going to happen? 900 people trying to call saying I'm going to be late. And what happens is your cell phone base station only handles 200. So unfortunately, 700 people are going to luck out, and they're not going to have access to the cell phone. So capacity is vital for our information age, because imagine, I'm not sure, luckily only one, two, three, four, five, five people with laptops open, an iPad, and maybe a few other iPads. But what ends up happening is, imagine if this wireless access point, all of you suddenly open up your laptops and try accessing it. You know. At some point, that guy will not be able to handle that much more traffic. And this applies to a lot of wireless applications. It's tied to bandwidth. It's tied to the number of channels it can support, data rates and the like. And so what ends up happening is user capacity is a huge issue. This is what we're experiencing right now. You know, cell phone networks are almost maxed out. We're going to reach a point where we're going to have, you know, not dropped calls. That would be super bad, but blocked access. We're like, Hello, like, you know, you're going to try and calling and it's blocked. You get a busy signal. Shoot, I'll try again. And you try over and over and over again. Those were the days. I grew up in that days, okay? The other type of capacity is how much data I can slush across. Given that bandwidth, given what we call the signal to noise ratio. This equation here was developed by Claude Shannon, okay? And so what Claude Shannon said, and this is a limit. This doesn't tell us how to build systems. It tells us if you built a system that was the best ever, it says that the amount of data that I can send across a channel is equal to the bandwidth of that channel in hertz times log 2, okay? 1 plus the, the signal power over the noise power, okay? And so what this guy tells, what Shannon did, and you know, he's a brilliant guy, and I'll show you what I mean. What he did basically, he says, this is the best possible data rate that you can achieve under these circumstances. And what this has done is this has created kind of like a communications, like, marathon. Every communications guy out there is like saying, well, I'm going to make a better modulation scheme that gets even closer than your scheme. Yeah, it was almost like, you know, one-upmanship. It's like, I'm going to make a better one. I'm going to make a better one. And, like, you know, I mean, it's un incredible. People are just, like, trying to get closer to this thing. And it was almost like life or death. But what Shannon did is basically spurred on the information age that we live in today. 
So with that, um, I, I'm not sure if you can click and paste this into your browser. This 23-minute video, if you have free time, if, we, if you have free time, describes the life of Claude Shannon. And he touched upon everything, including robotics, artificial intelligence, genomics, uh, information uh, theory, even digital logic. Like, this guy did everything. So check it out if you have a few free moments. Okay. Um, so have a great weekend. And don't forget, quiz on Monday. Okay. See you guys. Oh, actually, I should shut this down. But. <laughs>